Woot. We are less than a minute away. Wow, we can turn the game down on that because I'm a loud motherfucker. Well, we're hoping that Fabulous would show up just because we need her for certain uh, important tasks during the talk. We can go up a little bit more, actually. It's still Sunday morning. Let's find the balance. There we go. But since it is 1 p.m. and y'all are here very, very ready to go, without further ado, I would like to have my little presentation, which DerbyCon somehow let on the schedule amid all the... How many friggin' people are blown away at how many heavy hitters they packed into one little city for this first event? Yeah. I am I am really thrilled to be here. I hope this con succeeds as it looks like it's going to, and the energy is just fantastic. So right on into it. Without further ado, distinguishing picks. Well, not quite. Almost distinguishing picks, because there's a little order of business first. I don't know if any other speakers had implemented the U-Drink protocol in their talks, but it's something I do in mine. For those of you who don't know, why does U-Drink exist? Well, it's a little process. If you have a talk that you want to liven up, that you want some audience engagement with, or that you think you're a few slides short, you can pad it out by a few minutes by simply on stage preparing a drink for the audience, a drink you like, a drink you will tell them about. On stage, you dispense a drink, that drink is for you. If you screw up at any time during your talk, that drink is to be consumed by you. Also on stage, you prepare other drinks. Those drinks are not for you. Those drinks are for the audience. Someone asks a good question, they get a drink. That's how this works. Who is willing to ask good questions and have fun in this talk today? All right. So what is our drink today? Sunday. We are here on Sunday. It is a very good day for brunch. I did not have any brunch. I jammed a peach in my mouth before I got on stage. But, you know, Sunday is a day I associate with mimosas. That's a little girly. Maybe we'll let some other people have them. Maybe some people put orange juice in their screwdrivers. I like a screwdriver on a Sunday morning very, very much while I'm waiting for kickoff. However, this is Kentucky. We, we are here in Kentucky. It's not really vodka land. When I think Kentucky, I think bourbon. So you got to use some whiskey in your screwdrivers, which is very possible. I know friends of mine, I have friends in Canada, you know, they make a screwdriver very, very well. You can make, you, you know, you can make a screwdriver with whiskey. If you have Canadian whiskey, we like to call that a Robertson screwdriver. Hey, Canucks. You know, there's rye drivers, there's whatever you have it, but you know, we are going to make a Kentucky screwdriver. So we are going to mix bourbon, and OJ, and hopefully have some fun with this. So which bourbon did we use? We, we want to choose something, right? I'm a big fan of Woodford. There's a lot of good things. If you came to Bourbon Con, how many people came to the Bourbon Con tasting? Oh, man, we need more hands next year for that. There were a lot of good selections. We had a whole slew of tasting charts and everything else. We sampled a lot of good bourbon. Uh, this is a con, though. This is a hacker con, so we're not going to break the bank. Instead of really nice Woodford or Basils or anything, I'm just going with the kicking chicken. And that's how we're doing this. So that is our drink. It is ready for you. It is ready for, well, it's almost ready for me. Can somebody right up front top this up for me, please? You're my, you're, you're my designated guy. All right. Distinguishing picks. Why on earth did I make this talk? Well, I made this talk not just for the hobbyist community, the, the average, oh, I'm getting into lockpicking kind of community. Even, thank you, seasoned lockpickers get into debates with each other, with suppliers, all because of the confusion <laughs> surrounding lockpick tools and their names and their uses and how you can actually designate them. So in a really futile attempt to, to you know, put some order into this world, I threw together this little section that was kind of an addendum to like my book a while back. Total shite, don't buy it. The guy doesn't know what he's talking about in the book. No, I put this together and I was like, wow, you know, there's actually, there's actually some ground that we can try to build and talk about the same things when we try to call up different vendors, trying to order all these different tools. Because they all use different names and it's kind of a hodgepodge. And I think if we all get together, come on, we can all get along, you can actually do a lot more with your lock picking. If when you're talking to, oh man, how did you get that one open? Well, I used this hook pick, and then I and I used this rake. What? I don't. Do I have one of them? Hopefully, we can all get together and figure out which tools are which, and you know, move forward into the future. First, let's talk about metal. A lot of people don't realize that there are major differences between metal stocks that vendors will use. So, spring steel is going to perform very differently than stainless steel. That's going to perform very differently than other alloys. Titanium alloy is popular now from the sear pick guys. 
if you want non-magnetic tools. And other vendors are getting real experimental, coming up with crazy stuff. Some people want to try like beryllium copper and such. I've never used that in any of my picks. I think it would be really toxic if you start getting shavings in the air. So I'm no chemist, but I don't know what the LD50 is on my picks, but I don't really mess with that. But one thing you should understand, though, thickness has a lot to do with how the picks are going to perform. Every manufacturer tends to be pretty loyal to a certain thickness of their tools. And I mean the actual stock, the sheet stock they use to cut, punch, etch, whatever they do. And you'll say, D, wait a minute, come on, I've heard of there's like standard American picks and there's Euro picks, there's thin picks and thick. I've seen, you know, all these companies make the thin picks. No, not really. You might have two picks from the same vendor. And you say, well, there's the standard one. I got it here. And this is, look at the thin one. Turn those picks sideways. They will be the same stock. What you are actually getting when you get a thin pick from one vendor or another, it's a difference in the shaft. It's a difference in how the shaft is machined from the side. It's just a profile difference. That makes, it, that makes a difference. You're going to reach in a little more in a thin, crinkly keyway. But it's not actually different metal stock. If you want different you know, performance, different stock, you're going to have to go from different suppliers. The real confusing mess, however, not to do with thicknesses, is just names. And we are going to try to break down some categories here and try to all get on the same page. Right off the bat, what would you guys call these? Hooks? So I heard somebody say lifters. Yeah. Fingers. See, right? It, this is like a simple one. We haven't even gotten to, you know, crazy land yet. And we're already using different names. I usually would call these hooks. Many people kind of, you know, they'll talk about the shape of the tool or the movement of the tool. I think when you talk about something in terms of how it's moved, like, oh, this is a lifter, that gives people, especially new people starting out, the idea that they're boxed into a certain zone. Well, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't be, like, scrubbing with this. It's a lifting pick because I'm not, I'm, it's a lifter. Yeah, I'd usually lift with these, but that doesn't mean you're not going to have some guy who comes up with a crazy, unintended use for it, like flipping it upside down and trying to rock it and shake it, and all of a sudden that happens to open this lock really reliably. So I like encouraging that. I like encouraging people to think of, you know, what is the shape, but not necessarily how to use it. They should come up with that on their own. And my little scale in my head, I tried to break down the idea that how high the actual tip rises from the shaft is roughly what you can do to try to determine whether it's, you know, a short hook, a medium hook, I love the Gonzo hook. That's something that the Europeans came up with as the name for it. It's, uh, it's, you know, the Muppet's nose, Gonzo. They love that little round top hook that's, you know, rises almost twice as high as the, the shaft thickness or more. That long hook, I don't know. You know, there's, there's a lot of different uses for these tools, a lot of others I don't really like. If you're building out your own kit, I love the tiny ones that are kind of rounded. I don't really like the super long one unless you're trying to pick handcuffs. How about this, though? Well, what is this? Would you call this a hook? How many people would call this a hook? Nobody. How many people would call it something else? Two hands. What, what would you call it? Crescent. Ooh, I've never heard that. I've usually heard these referred to as reaching tools, which is strange, right? Because, you know, a hook is something you, you reach in and try to lift with. These are kind of used to rock in much more than direct, you know, vertical lifting. You see people kind of rocking these either on their hands or right on the edge of the keyway. A couple manufacturers make these. They're usually really custom jobs. The bottom one, I think, is made by Lock Newbie. He's a guy who posts a lot online. I think Legion from the 303 might make a one kind of like that. The Deep Curve, I've seen that in the John Fall pick set. Everyone's seen these, though. Let's get simple again. What are these? Half diamonds. Very good. The diamond family is probably one of the oldest pick designs that I've ever seen. It's the first one that people kind of play with when they're making their own. They come in different sizes, yes. Again, there is no accepted standard. I like to think that whether the half diamond is rising half a whole or one and a half times the thickness of the shaft is kind of where you could benchmark whether it's a small, medium, or large diamond. There is that double-sided diamond. I've seen that in actual toolkits. I have no idea why I've seen that in toolkits. I can't imagine using that in a toolkit. But yeah, you know, a typical average medium-sized diamond is usually all you want. Ah, what are these? Yeah, they're, they're kind of diamondy. Somebody's using a word like offset. Yes, these are offset tools. You could call this, you know, an offset diamond or an offset ball, maybe even an offset snake. 
Somebody said the word DeForest. They are, the actual original name for the top pick was the DeForest pick. Occasionally you'll see them, usually with very thin shafts. These are delicate reaching tools. They are delicate lifting tools. You're not going to usually want to reach in there and just bang them around and rock them really hard. If you're just starting out, maybe not the first thing you need in your kit. I got one as a gift once. I still keep it around, and I like it, but it's not, you know, the first, I'm going to get in here and try to, you know, scrub around kind of tool. They're delicate. I don't really know, you know, why there's a rake in this, in this position. I wouldn't really snake around, you know, an offset snake that often. Tool has experimented with making them before. Maybe they'll be popular. Maybe they'll be the new hotness. Maybe someone next year at DerbyCon will have the awesome offset snake talk and how you can do all these badass things with it. Uh, stranger things have happened. I don't know. How about balls, balls, balls? Tell me Nikki's in this room. Yes, there you go. This is just a slide for you, dearest. There are a lot of ball picks. There are a lot of double ball, single ball, etc. You know, if you have them around because they came for free in a kit you bought, fine. It's not like you got ripped off. I wouldn't go out to every manufacturer you can find and buy one of their ball picks in like every thickness of steel just to round out that collection of yours. They're not going to do a whole lot other than scrub around maybe in a wafer lock. You know, I like maybe the snowman or the half snowman is okay. I, I will actively mock you if you have a half single ball. It is virtually no different than a diamond that's kind of worn off. So don't, again, this, this whole talk is to tell you there are some cool differences in some tools, but there's not a lot of difference in many tools. You don't need to go out and buy the 50-piece, you know, kit that has both varieties of fat and thin double, ball, you know, ball, blah, 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 unless you just like balls. All right, what would you call these? I heard snakes, I heard rakes, I heard somebody mumbling something in the back. Maybe it was just drink. So she's breaking down the actual names. Yes, these are all in general raking tools. But holy shit, welcome to crazy town with raking tool names. There are more vendors calling more things more names than I have ever seen anywhere else in the lockpicking world. I like to think the classic original design of the snake tool is a little up, down, up, down, up, a big and small hump. If it is three quarters of that, I will call it a three quarter snake. If it is only one hump, that is a half snake. I have actually seen somebody producing a double snake. We were in their warehouse looking at all their tools. I said, how many of these do you sell? He said, I don't know. I don't think we ever have. It exists. They called it a quad rake. I don't know why. I would never buy one. Stretch snakes, batarangs, as Nikki points out, the little bottom one there, we used to see a lot of those more often than we do now. They are very easy to break. Did you break one once in Gringo Warrior, I think, inside of a lock? Yeah, so the batarang we used to love just because it's a cool name, but, you know, it was very, very weak and would snap off. I like most of my tools to have a kind of consistent thickness, maybe tapering down as they go out to the tip. It makes them less likely to break. But yeah, there are a billion other names for these. There's probably more than I even found just going through catalogs, putting this chart up. So if we can all get together and maybe say that raking might be the movement of the tool that most people use, but the actual tool itself, the names of the specific picks individually, this one is a batarang, this one is a snake, this one is a stretch snake. Because again, it, con it conveys the idea that it has a shape but you are in charge of how you use it. Don't let someone else convince you that their technique is better than yours or that you're doing something wrong because you're holding it in a weird way according to them. It's, it's up to you how you want to do this kind of stuff. Which leads us to a very interesting point. A lot of people would probably group this tool that I've highlighted in with the raking category. I've even seen it called a rake before. What about something like this? What would we actually call this? How, are there any other names you would have for this? A saw, somebody else said something. What was that, a scroller, what? Scrubber. <laughs> Her favorite tool ever. This gets into something you don't see addressed a lot, even in, you know, basic, like, intro courses and training videos in our village when we do lessons. We don't really talk about the distinction, distinction, whoa, drink, sorry. The distinction between raking and lifting. And I don't mean lifting like, you know, with a hook lifting. I mean lifting with a tool like that. Lifting, as opposed to scrubbing back and forth, there is actual, you know, scrubbing at different angles. Lifting is the insertion and slow movement 
up and down and in and out of a tool designed to try to set all the pins more or less at once. You're trying to get lucky and hope that you can approximate the bidding of the key so well that you might just get the pins into the shear line with a couple of lifts, a couple of pulsed you know, bits of tension pressure. Not a lot of people use this technique. You don't see it, it's not very conducive to you know, contest picking where everyone's hands are really moving rapidly. It's a quick, you know, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. A little bit of fingers crossed, you might get lucky. All of these tools are more or less jagged lifter tools, which is weird because they're sometimes referred to as rakes in catalogs. I usually would you know, call this one the long jag, the one we were talking about earlier, that wedge up top there. That's, I've seen people try to rake with it, and it's usually called a wedge rake or a W rake. I don't know why. I could never imagine trying to rake with that tool. It is something you reach in and kind of oscillate up and down. Notice particularly the John Fall family of tools at the bottom, including the long rimple, as our Dutch friends love to call that hump. Look at the shafts. Look how thin and precarious those are, those are engineered. Those are not designed for rough handling. Those are not designed for raking and abusive movement. They're designed for very gentle, is it? How about this? Maybe, maybe. Cross your fingers and kind of hope lifting movement. Now there is some talk of people saying, oh, these were computer engineered. They were, you know, the algorithms to closely approximate this or that most likely key bidding. I don't know if that much thought actually went into all of these. John Fall is the type of guy who probably would have done that. The American manufacturers, Southern, Southern Ordnance, all those guys, we, we like them. We talk to them all the time on the phone. I don't think they're sitting there with tons of CAD diagrams and math calculators and doing crazy algorithm tables. I think they just said, hey, everyone else produces this thing. We should produce it too. It sells well. And it does, you know. It's not a bad thing, but try that. Try lifting once in a while. Try just jag lifting, which leads to these. What the fuck are these? They are called the king and queen pick. If you have them in your kit, you probably already know this because they're not something you just see on every lockpick sales table. They're absolutely just lifters. They are like the Hail Mary, nothing else worked. I'm going to try occasionally just lifting these into the pins sort of tool. I think Skylar Town used these once in a competition, and I don't know how well it worked out for him, but you know he's the only person I've ever seen even try these. Because, again, it's not a rapid, oh, my God, I'm trying to get this lock open kind of tool. Look at, again, pay attention to how thin that shaft is, how likely it is to break. Do you think a batarang is fragile? These are way more fragile. But all this comes around as a way of talking about a different technique that some of you, I think most of you, may have heard of, but I don't know how often you've tried. A guy in Minnesota, with a little tip of the hat towards his time in Columbia, created a new family of tools. Can anyone specify? Anyone know which ones I'm talking about? Bogotas. This is the room of smart people. Raimundo, a really nice cat. He hangs out at the, uh, the hacker space up in Minnesota. And he makes all these Bogota tools by hand. And they are not really rakes. They're not really lifters. They're, they're an interesting type of tool. It started off with these two jiggler tools. Now, some people may have heard of jigglers. If you were in our training, we use jigglers on wafer locks. Different thing entirely, the repo man kind of jigglers. These two tools, the, the triple hump Bogota and the open diamond, the little single knuckle, are used not really as rakes. And you can tell they're, they're very strange, the handles on them. A lot of people think, what, what the fuck is this? And you say, well, no, I mean, Raimundo makes them like that because they're a tensioner and a pick. And you say, huh, all right, I, I, guess, I guess I get it. Kind of dumb looking. No, it's, it's not dumb looking. You actually hold these a very different way, and you oscillate your hand a different way. In between straight raking and direct, you know, lift, lift, lifting, there is jiggling. And jiggling is this weird, you know, kind of corkscrewy, almost elliptical movement with the pick bent over your finger, and you're just kind of oscillating it around really lightly, pistoning in and out. This, this is like so sex heavy, all these words that I'm using. It's very <laughs> spanked revision. Jiggling, if you can, it's delicate, but if you can get it to work for you, if I'm being told to drink, why did I, because I made a sex reference, really? This was a bad sex reference, that's, that's why we're doing that. You, you two in the front, you drink, grab cups right now. There you go, just for that. Yeah, so there is, I haven't been giving out drinks for people who called out, the, if you called out the name of a pick and I said, yeah, yeah, one of those, uh, you come up and, and grab a cup. 
right now. I heard voices. Get up out of your fucking chairs and, and follow this guy. So, yeah, the whole Bogota family. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's, there's two effing pictures up here. Christ. I'm not driving home with that in the car. The original Bogota family was just two tools, the Bogota, or triple hump, and the single hump, or hollow diamond. It's since then expanded. There's a two-hump tool. There's, he's made a quad hump. He made one that has two humps spread apart, called a sabana. There's a really nice review that was posted and put up on a blog by John King. John King's a really nice guy. Uh, he's hanging out with us a lot at DEF CON. He's on the Tamper team, the motherfucking professionals that always wins that Tamper contest. He put a really great review with all different locks that he tried these in, all different techniques. And he has a nice chart on when they work well, when they don't, etc. There are two other tools that I'll talk about at the end after we mention this thing. The Wave Jiggler, which we kind of call the Fogota. It's not bad. Our friends at Southern Specialties make it. They include it in their catalog. We have it in our kits usually when we have different tools for sale at the tool booths. It's not quite a Bogota because it doesn't have that bent, you know, oscillator handle. You can either twist bend it yourself or you can kind of, you know, try to duplicate that oscillating jiggly movement. But keep that in mind. Keep the idea of jiggling in mind as opposed to just raking if you want to try to grab a Fogata sometime. The other offerings, by the way, from Ramundo are the Montserrat family, the fore and aft Montserrat. So yeah, if you try this out, keep this in mind about jiggling, jiggling, jiggling. It might really, really shock you how effective it is compared to simple straight lateral raking. There are really, really neat variations on this. If there are any actual, you know, overseas operators in this room, if you've not heard of Searpick, find out about Searpick. Really great bunch of cats. They make a lot of tools and other elements in titanium with zero magnetic footprint, handcuffed shims. They make the Bogota picks. I was giving, I don't know if, I think they told me I can tell this story. So I was giving a talk at an NSA facility. And they said, all right, you know, you can't have your cell phones. You can't have any tech on you if you guys have ever gone into an, un if you're uncleared and all this other shit. So you're going in and they have to, you know, they, what are all these things? I'm like, oh, Christ, it's a bunch of lock, it's a bunch of crazy crap. Well, that was okay. They already knew that I was bringing picks for the lesson. And I said, all right, well, if I'm bringing picks, I guess I could bring them in the luggage. I could, I'm going to try this. I left these in my shoe. And I passed through the metal detector and everything, and these did not alert at all. So if these don't alert at NSA, I'm pretty sure the sear pick Bogotas in titanium are not really going to alert anywhere. Also, interestingly, I disarmed in the car, but I had my CompTAC uh, Minotaur holster, which has also all plastic, you know, composite on it. That also did not alert. So I like that, that my carry rig is very, you know, low profile, magnetically. I, I am not low profile, but magnetically, I am. Couple more tip. That was a bad joke. I'm going to jink on that one. Couple more tips. When is a diamond not a diamond? Well, when it is an extractor tool. This comes for free in a lot of toolkits. Not as much anymore. When you used to, you know, the, the, when Southern especially just became popular, Southern Ordnance would sit, you know, had this really nice 25 piece kit. And this was in there. And people would, you know, I'd see people picking with it and this and that. And I'm like, huh, did you, you notice that the handle is really different? It usually had a blue coating on the rubberized handle. The shaft is a weird shape. This is not a pick, it has this weird back jag on it. Even though it looks kind of right at home with these, you know, diamond type tools, this is more akin to tools like this. This is just used to remove broken keys from locks and detritus that might wind up in the lock. Broken pieces of other picks if you break a, you know, batarang. How many people tried impressioning in the lockpick village this weekend? A couple of hands. How many people did impressioning in our training this week? Very, very nice. Yeah, so we break keys. You break a lot of keys during impressioning. That's what this extractor tool is for. It's not really for anything else. Ultimately, what do you really, really need in your kit? Oh, you, you need me in my kit. I will gladly go with you on any job, sir. I will, I will stick myself in your trunk. You won't even know I'm there. Pop out at the right moment. So yeah, do you need the super gigantic kit? Probably not. Typical basic kits. One of my friends had this really nice clean kit. More often than not, you start seeing people, and we didn't talk about tensioners here, but carrying more tensioners than they do picks. There's clapping. Oh, very good. All right. Tensioner. A man loves his tension. You get a drink for loving tensioners. 
Who else likes more tensioners than they do picks? All right, you all get to come up and have a cocktail just for being smart. Yeah, if your tensioner does not seat well in the keyway, if your tensioner is not anchoring properly, giving you really good bite without causing additional friction, much of what you're doing with a pick tool is counterproductive. And it sounds almost, you know, reversed to, for me to say this. It is more important what you do with tensioning tools when you're picking locks than anything you do with the actual picks themselves. And again, it'll sound like I'm flipping you in your head here. It is the tensioner that opens this lock for you. The pick is just moving some components around. They have to get moved, yeah, but it is the tensioner that is applying just the right amount of finesse and force for that movement to make any sense. It is the difference, basically, between goons and cops. Cops can get a bunch of people moving around, but they'll be angry and won't want to pay attention, and you know they're like, why are we doing this? I don't know where to go. Goons get people moving just the right way at just the right time with just the right amount of force whether they have to crank you down on the head or just coax you the right way with, you know, a big reefer and say, no, go down, go down that hallway. Yes, the tension tool, how much discipline you can have with it, how well you can be soft with it at just the right moments, how well it anchors into the lock, what purchase you get with that. Bear that in mind a lot and ask people in the village about that a lot. Try a lot of different tensioners. Tensioners, unlike picks, you can make all these tools yourself. Homemade pick tools are fine, they're fun. There's a lot of people who do that, and they swear by their homemade tools. You need some grinders, you need some time, you need patience, you gotta polish them. Tensioners, come on, any, it's a bent piece of fucking metal. Anyone can make tensioners. Find weird stock, find metal from, shout out some places you can find good metal for tensioners. Windshield wiper blades, I heard. Street sweeper bristles. There's even, what? At Lost's house, yes. Come hang out with Lost. Look through all his old components in his boneyard. Yeah, there's so many places. There's even a nice offering. There's a lot. Metal from bras, yes. Bra underwires. There are photos of that from Argentina, a guy who made them. You all get drinks, by the way, everyone who just suggested good stuff, so come on up. Yeah, there's even a tool called a U-Bendit. Uh, it's offered by Peterson. The Peterson catalog tends to, is that the U-Bendit right there? Oh, Scott, I was holding it. That's what you were showing us. The Peterson catalog tends to be a little spendy. They're usually very government-focused tools. But the U-Bendit is a great offering. And it's not that bad. It's like nine, ten bucks maybe, uh, something like that. Just designed for, you know, oh, man, I wish I had a pair of vice grips and a pair of needle nose and I can make a tensioner. No, if you have this little U-Bendit, you can make almost anything into a tensioner. So try that. Try tensioners of all kind of different thicknesses. It might really, really surprise you what you can open up. What about, oh, automatic tension? I know what you mean. So the question is, you get a drink for this. All right, he's got too many. The question is, what about automatic tensioners? Usually, is that for me as well? All right, thank you. Uh, it's usually they kind of clamp or clip on to the lock face, and there's almost a dial or a calibrated spring mechanism that will provide tension. I think it's, um, it's you know, rock in a hard place, six of one, half a dozen of the other. You're losing tactile feedback that the tensioner would normally give you, but it's controlling and being, you know, it's being, being able to manage your tension in a way that your hands might, put it this way, if your hands aren't very good and you're probably not, you know, you're losing more in over-tensioning and messing yourself up than anything you're getting back in feedback, Sure, buy the kind of expensive automatic tensioner. If you think you've got some good picking under your belt, if you know what you're doing, I think you're going to get yourself much more you know, benefit from the feedback than anything you would save by really controlling and measuring delicately with you know, an automatic tensioner. Uh, was lost at a question. Oh. So lost is referring to the feather touch tensioner. Has anyone seen those? They're like a loop of metal, and yeah. Um, I don't like those. I used to have them around when I was starting out. I, the, yeah, you lose all the sensation. It's really hard to even apply proper tension, because there are times where you need a little more tension. Deadbolt, for example. You can get the deadbolt picked, but then you still, once it's broken over you know, five degrees, you still have to flip it to get the bolt to throw. 
at that point, you, you're just going to break, you're gonna destroy the tensioner. You need something that has enough bite that you can get in there and flip it, or just you know jam a screwdriver and, and bang it over. But that's not as you know not as classy. Yeah, I hope the, I hope the feather touch tensioner dies in a fire. I think it was a, a, an interesting idea, and its time has passed. The reversal. What is the? Oh, plug spinners. Yes, if you pick the wrong direction, is it possible to you know flip the plug over without the pins dropping back in? Absolutely. Plug spinners all suffer from one flaw, and that flaw is size. Nobody wants to carry them around. Probably the nicest plug spinner I've seen is made by HPC. HPC is a wonderful manufacturer of picks and pick tools, by the way. Very nice family business based out of Chicago. Alan and his family are great. The HPC plug spinner is, you know, I'm not going to say it's the size of this microphone, but it's about as thick as it is. It's not something you just throw in your little foldy flat pocket kit. The nicest plug spinner for carry everywhere is probably the Peterson one. Peterson makes a small, relatively flat, blue plastic one with a little metal head, and it's got a spring. It, it works very well. All of these are kind of a crapshoot. You're gonna, I'm gonna say you got about a 60%, maybe 70% chance of them working. The best advice I can give is get the plug back as close to top dead center as it as you can without catching the pins. So get it all the way back, and then get your plug spinner ready. Blam and hope that it'll just flip all the way over. If you've ever not had a plug spinner and wanted one, you know how incredibly frustrating it is sometimes. There are locks. Maybe there was this lock on a roof on a pen testing job that we were on that uh, everyone and their dog could pick the wrong way. And nobody, it was a piece of crap quick set. Nobody could pick it the right way. And people were sticking you know, rubber bands around a, a tension tool and trying to stretch them and release and snapping their hands off. And, yeah, there's a lot of improv that I've seen with, you know, you know, flipping tools, plug spinner tools when you don't have one. So maybe, you know, get it and include it in your car kit, not the one that's in your pocket all the time, the one that you have around. You know, for me, like, if I'm carrying just, you know, on an everyday job, I'll have a really small kit. I'll have something, again, probably more tensioners than picks, but not a lot of variety. What do we have in there? A couple of hooks, there's a Bogota, one diamond, there you go. The big, you know, I have a place for everything kit. Yeah, a lot of us have them. That's not something you tote everywhere. That's actually something that you leave, you know, in your con supplies where you're like, oh, man, what was I thinking when I bought this? Oh, I won this in a contest. I'm never going to carry this. Somebody left this thing on the table. I don't want to just throw it out. It usually winds up in a big roll like this. You might find a use for it someday. You really don't need that with you on every job because you guys are all pen testers, right? You do this professionally. Every day, like super ultra light carry, cannot top these two things in my opinion. I am going to be a shill for a second and say I love the tool pick card. The easy break apart, you know, I have six picks, tensioners all around in the frame. That card, Bobak of the tool group, has been refining and refining and refining. The new metal, we've, we've dropped it down to like 020 in thickness, and it's harder and more durable than the, the previous versions. The high yield steel we're using is redonkulous. The electro polish finish makes it gorgeous. I love that. I don't always have, oh, we're running out already. Cool, thank you. I don't always have a tool card with me, usually because I give them away. I always, 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 if there's any law enforcement in the room, this is me declaring it prior to my arrest. I always have Bogotas on me. And I usually just don't even think they're there until the time when I'm like, oh crap, I need to open something. Yeah, you know, they're, they're somewhere on me. I won't tell you where. Enough of these, you might find them. Yeah. So what all this comes down to, I'm, I'm not this guy. I am not the Lord and Savior of all things lockpicking. I hate being recognized like, oh, you're that lock guy. What do you do with the village here, man? I'm like, dude, it's, it's Nathan and Zach and the fools. They, the, the friggin' fools did a great fucking job here. How many people hung out with them? Yeah. Yeah, we are a community of men. No one of us has, like, the supreme knowledge of anything. What does Bruce say every time he gets on stage? Don't believe everything I say. You know, we are we are not lords. This is don't believe it. This is how old is this picture? How awesome is that? That's like Defcon 8 or something. Back when he had a beard. Yeah, don't believe everything we say. If something is working better for you than what we're trying to tell you, do it your way and then like come to the contest and then show us up and make us look bad. Because whatever we are suggesting is just that. It's just what works for us. What you do with your tools, where you get them, how you get them. That's entirely your bag. 
It all comes down to whether it's going to open for you. It's all about you, and it's all good. So if it opens, if the lock opens, that's great. If you find something new that's awesome, tell us about it. Make your own talk about it. If you make a new tool, be the next Ramundo. Get up here at the next DerbyCon and be like, hey, I made this crazy flip wonk it. And you'd never imagine it, but if you smack yourself on the ass and blink three times, like, the lock opens. Like, tell us about that, man. That's badass. I love seeing new shit come around. I love when people, you know, have their own ideas, and I love learning from you guys. So thank you very, very, very much. And we have time for questions. So we got a couple announcements, and then we're going to do questions. Is Garrett here? Garrett from our training, are you here? All right. Thank you. And everybody thank Johnny for coming all the way back from Uganda to be here with us. So while we're on the topic of announcements, um, I hope we would have time for one more quick one. And it looks like we do, because we're doing really good on time. Um, this is something I mention occasionally during my talks when I have enough time at the end. And I'm glad to talk to you now. I occasionally, has anyone heard of the Traveling Terabyte before? Thank you. So the Traveling Terabyte project was something we created in the hacker community when friends of ours couldn't make it to some DEF CONs a long time ago. A lot of people we knew were deployed in uniform. And they were just stuck overseas. And they said, shit, man, I'm going to miss all the talks and all the DEF CON movies and this and that. So I had this job where I was you know, building a new server array back when 500 gigs was the biggest hard drive. And I ordered some extra drives. I said, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm buying them in a bulk pack. I'm going to get a couple more out of pocket. And I took these two 500 giggers, packed them in external, you know, ca external cases, put them in a little Pelican case with every adapter I could think of. And we just filled it up with content. We filled it up with movies and music and DEF CON talks and other CON talks and everything we had. And we just started kicking it around to deployed units. And it became popular. We made a second one. And we said, man, all right, this is fucking amazing. These people really dig this. So we started sending these around. And we get pictures back from the field. And people say, oh, man, that was really neat. I'm so glad, you know, have a little taste of home. That was very, very cool. Can you send us, you know, I love some of Jackalope's music. Can you put the, oh, I love, you know, the Family Guy. Can you put new Family Guys on there? I love Christmas stuff. We make Christmas care packages with like every possible cr cheesy Christmas special you can think of. And we burn them onto DVDs and other kind of things. So the Traveling Terabyte Project has become this little taste of home that we just want to send out to anybody who is, you know, unable to be home. And as tech has evolved and drives have gotten bigger and cases have need to get smaller, nowadays the traveling terabytes are all just, you know, little mini Pelican cases with single terabyte external drives the size of a cell phone. You know, they're smaller than a 556 round, basically. We do this. We also make flash drives. It's amazing. Isn't it? This is like, you know, three years worth of tech evolution right there. That's amazing how the curve shifts. In addition to the hard drives, we do make flash drives. We put, I mean, you know, we've touched a lot of lives that we try to just kind of anybody who writes into us, anybody who says, oh, my son or daughter, my, aunt, my nephew, et cetera, so-and-so is overseas, we will get something out. We usually have more flash drives than hard drives, and we give them out you know, just for free in airports to anybody we can think of, anybody writes in. But if you have somebody, we're not up here asking really for money. It, what we do is if you have anybody who wants a little taste of home, write to us. We will figure something out. We always do like one big push to produce flash drives once a year, right around, you know, I guess, I guess probably, probably November, we're going to have to make another run of them. If you're interested, write to me. If you want a hard drive to someone, all we ask is that if you get the hard drive to me somehow, I will fill it with content and I will get it to their APO or FPO or stateside address if they're just billeted somewhere on base. But we're, we're not looking for uh, anything other than people to spread the word. So if you know somebody, or if you know somebody who might know somebody who wants a little taste of the U.S., you know, crappy cable TV and e-books and everything else that goes with it, just, uh, just tell us, and we'll do our best to help them. So thank you for, for passing the word on that, and I appreciate you letting me tell you. Now we can do real questions. Yes.
Yeah, the, the last we did, the flash drives are 32 gigs, so I, I went for the biggest I could get, and they're like little weather-resistant ones and shit. So yeah, it was about two grand for the drives. We did 50 drives, and then we did some lanyards and dog tags. So it usually comes in a little over two grand to do a package of 50. It's all. It's always nice whenever anyone uh, supports, but that's not why. You know, I just want to spread the word. But I appreciate you you bringing it up. Well, I appreciate. I appreciate all the support you've shown in the past. What was there a question? Yes, behind you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Well, there you go. So, ro nice. Rogue points out that they still ship the extractor tool, even in the 14-piece. I think it's the City Elite set. Uh, and it's not specially marked. And she has good luck with it. So again, if you have good luck with it, by all means, yes. Okay. So the back edge snags. All right. Yes, right here. So, very common question, can you, I'm going to flip back to the last URL slide, will you or can you get in trouble for carrying these tools around? Usually no is the answer to that question, <laughs> but I'll give you a better answer. Um, and I will preface this by saying I am not a lawyer, I am not your lawyer, nothing I say up here constitutes a legal arrangement. Um, Tool, Tool has very good lawyers. Tool has spent more than five, fi well no, we've spent five figures on our lawyers researching all 50 states. Uh, we are going to have a document just for our membership and then for the public regarding what we found. What we have found is what most people in the community already kind of know. Lock picks are treated as burglary tools under the law in just about all 50 states. That sounds bad, unless you ask anybody who is a Leo who you know about burglary tools, and they will tell you big screwdrivers, crowbars, pliers, those are all burglary tools. A brick, I think, is a burglary tool in the right context. Burglary tool statutes in the criminal code of almost every state specify intent. Intent as a causal factor is what makes something into a burglary tool. If it can be shown that you have committed a crime with a tool or intend to commit a crime with a tool, the intent is what makes it illegal. Now, caveat, we're, like, we're, we're nesting our clauses here. Sub-caveat, mere possession of lock picks, not of crowbars and hammers, possession of lock picks is enough to show intent, which can then make them criminal. Now, that is not an ironclad throw you in jail and lose the key, but that means it's, it's an end run, honestly, around the Constitution. If anyone is a lawyer, they'll tell, me, they'll tell you about prima facie evidence. On its face, the evidence is not in your favor in certain states. I believe on a quick list, Mississippi, Virginia, one other state that I can't possibly, it's uh, Nevada, I think. <laughs> you know, it's not like we do hacky shit in Nevada ever. Those are some of the about five, maybe six states that have such clauses. That is not, again, it's not a guarantee that you're going to run into trouble. It means it is on you to show that you do not have ill intent. And coming to a reputable and wondrous event like a derby con, where you attended a professional, you know, very classy talk about, you know, physical entry, if you took a training, if you did anything that says, look, I have a person with a job and pay taxes and I'm a security professional, that's usually, again, I'm not a lawyer, enough that you should not, if you wind up before a judge, some prosecutor's looking to beef his or her numbers and just get a lawyer and work on it. There, I do know there is no case law on the books with respect to any of these, you know, lockpick possession crimes. 
that did not have massive other circumstances, like guys with TVs all into their car and all kind of shit. Yes. Yeah, so check your local ordinance as well. Also, interestingly, two other states I'll mention, uh, I believe it's Tennessee that has a law in the books now just outright saying no one should have them unless they are a locksmith. Usually more common, is that five? What am I getting? Okay. Usually more common are statutes that ban the act of locksmithing, trading as a locksmith without a license. North Carolina is such a state. So again, most of these laws, even the ones that we think are draconian, they're designed to prevent wildcatters and driller killers from ripping off the public. If you're not practicing as a locksmith illegally, you're probably fine. But ask your own lawyers. We'll do one and then two. Sorry, miss. Yes. Yeah, TSA is fine. Yeah, they are they are a tool under seven inches with no bladed edge. Mm -hmm. Yes. Rogue clown talks. The rogue clown is that. The spy store in Chicago, apparently, our local second cityers are telling you is a good place to go. So if you're a Chicagoan, yeah, you can go to the local tool chapter or the Skokie, Illinois spy store. Um, yes. Okay. So you have bad memory is what you're saying because you haven't learned from this. For cars. The question was, are there picks that are more geared just to automotive entry? Uh, the quick answer, because we got to keep it clicking. Uh, yes, there are. Most automotive locks are wafer locks, which are shitty locks usually, but they are du dual-sided almost always. One minute we got? All right. So you're going to deal with either jiggler-type tools, special auto repo jigglers, or dual-sided picks. Quick note, many, co many uh, communities have different criminal statutes for anything related to auto. Check your laws on that one. We'll do one, and then there was another two, and we got to bang it out. Done. Dimple locks. Yes, they make specialized dimple picks. We didn't show photos of them. They look like little hockey sticks that kind of turn in a pinch. Use a half diamond. Half diamond is a great dimple lifter. One more over here. Maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. All right. I think we're... Oh, there there you were. You were waiting. Cock and balls. I can't hear you. Come on. Snap your fingers with a flathead screwdriver as an improv plug spinner. I love improv stuff. I love quick answers, and I love simple things that you create. I'm going to try that in the future. Thanks to you, and thanks to all you guys for coming out.